locking up the worst criminals. Since 1988, we've caught 1,191 fugitives. We're tracking down one of the most ruthless gangs of lawbreakers we've ever gone after. Including several of the FBI's most wanted. And we've reunited dozens of missing children with their families. But the job continues, and this time, my son Callahan joins the fight. With your help, we're gonna put more low-life criminals behind bars, including these that you'll see tonight. Up first, a nursing student vanishes in the night before her body turns up in the North Carolina woods, and the man suspected of killing her is on the run. Then, authorities bust a sophisticated drug ring on the East Coast, but one of its dangerous alleged traffickers manages to escape. We need your help to find Samuel Rhodes. And finally, a DNA match that shocks investigators on both coasts. Have you seen the man police say is wanted for this mother of five's gruesome murder? America's Most Wanted is the original true crime series. You can run, but you can't hide. I'm John Walsh. And I'm Callahan Walsh. And this is America's Most Wanted. Tonight, thanks to your incredible tips, the AMW catch counter is up to 1,192 captures. We put another dangerous fugitive behind bars. Now, two weeks ago, we asked for your help finding Davy Alberon. He went on the run after being charged with child abuse, molestation, and sexual battery of his own family members who were minors. When his two adult daughters found out what he had done, they made it their mission to find him and get his victims justice. So this is my father. He's Osceola's most wanted for his crimes against kids. When his last victim came out, who happened to be my daughter, everything came out. So I found out last year that my father hurt my knees. I got upset and I posted this on Facebook. Like in a matter of hours, this was viral. I just want to give a big thank you to everyone who's been helping us and supporting us. That means a lot to my family and I. Anna and John Ady's story was so inspiring. I knew America's Most Wanted could help catch their father. What would you want to say to him? How dare you? How dare you? I gave you, I trusted you with what was most precious to me. You know, I, I just, turn, turn yourself in. That's all I can say. Turn yourself in. We're not going to stop. He's on my personal top ten. And I never quit. We never quit. Thank you so much. <laughs> After our show aired, tips started coming in, placing Alberon in the Tampa, Florida area, specifically in the town of Lakeland. Just before midnight on February 18th, authorities surrounded a house belonging to one of Alberon's relatives. Two Polk County Sheriff's deputies and their canine partner caught Alberon in the backyard. Thanks to some quick police work, your tips, and the dedicated work of his own daughters, Davy Alberon was finally behind bars. Any scumbag who harms a child is nothing short of a monster in my book. Davy's daughters, Anna and John Ady, are so grateful to all of you at home. Thank you to America's Most Wanted and anybody who called in with a tip that helped get justice for my daughter. Thank you to John Walsh and to Callahan Walsh and to everybody there at America's Most Wanted. And we did it! We did it. Now, that's one more fugitive off the streets, and we know tonight, with your help, we can get that number even higher. Now, to our first case. A young woman immigrates to America to rebuild her life after a personal loss, then mysteriously disappears. She had a really bright future, studying to be a nurse, and made an impression on everyone she met, including the man allegedly responsible for a crime so callous, so brutal, it landed him a spot on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted. Truck Quan Lai Lee, we know her as Sandy. She was from Vietnam, and she came here to live with relatives in Charlotte after the death of her mother. Sandy was a very good student. She was going to school at Queens College, and she was studying nursing. She worked at a Greek restaurant, a chain here called Shomars. Everybody just had nothing but fantastic things to say about Sandy. Sandy bonded quickly with her co-workers, especially Alex Castillo, who she started dating. Their relationship ended in April 2016, 
when Sandy stopped working in the restaurant to focus on school and continue her dream of becoming a nurse. On August 9th, Sandy told her family she was running out about 8.45 at night to the local store to pick up something. They were very troubled when she didn't return home because Sandy is very accountable. This just is not like her. When Sandy didn't return home the next morning, her family filed a missing persons report. Detectives started looking through Sandy's iPad, and we discovered some conversations between Sandy and Alex. Sandy had loaned Alex $1,000 about two months prior. She wanted her money back. On August 9th, he communicated, hey, I got your $1,000. Let's meet up. As we follow up on Sandy's bank records, we recognize that the night that Sandy goes missing, one of her cards has been used at an ATM to make a large withdrawal. She withdraws another $1,000. That stumps us because the original meetup plan from Alex was to return money, yet she is at the ATM withdrawing more money. But she does not appear to be under any duress. Two days after Sandy's disappearance, and with still no leads, police and family members continued their search of the greater Charlotte area. Meanwhile, two other Shomar's employees are also reported missing by their families. Charlotte Mecklenburg, 911. I want a uh, report of lost my son. No me contesta el teléfono. Su teléfono está apagado. Alex Castillo and Amia Feaster, who Alex was now in a relationship with, have not returned home or responded to calls and texts in almost 48 hours. When three young folks go missing at the same time and there's no explanation, it's not just family members that become concerned. That certainly starts sending up alarm bells for us as well. Then on August 13th, four days after Sandy's mysterious ATM withdrawal, and two days after Alex and Amia go missing, the investigation makes a shocking turn. Alex and Amia call their parents individually and let them know that everything's fine. But at no point are they able to explain really where they've gone to and where Sandy. Alex and Amia say they've hit the road. They were last seen here at a QT gas station on the east side of Charlotte on August 10th at 4.33 in the morning. But since Alex was the last person believed to see Sandy in person, detectives think the couple could be hiding what they know about her disappearance. The Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department reached out to the FBI to assist in a missing person investigation. We gathered information from speaking to relatives of Amia and Alex, and that they were trying to go see his father in Aguas Calientes, Mexico we obtain video of them crossing over the border. You see Alex and you see Amia. It looks like they were packed, ready to go. It was planned. With confirmation that Alex and Amia crossed into Mexico, detectives still needed to find Sandy. Charlotte police utilized every possible resource from the helicopter, canine, patrol, you name it, to actively look for Sandy. Based on phone records, Sandy received a text shortly before midnight on August 9th. And from that, we were able to track her last location. And we were able to zone in on an area close to the woods in Harrisburg, North Carolina. On August 17th, a day after Alex and Amia escaped to Mexico, and eight days after Sandy made her fateful ATM withdrawal, Investigators make a shocking discovery deep in the Carolina woods. Sandy's body was discovered. Sandy had been shot in the back of the head. This was now a homicide investigation. Those are the words that no parent, no family member ever wants to hear. Because when someone you love goes missing, you hold on to the hope that they're out there alive. And that's why we talk about this so much at the National Center. Time really is of the essence. If you believe your child or teenager has gone missing or has been abducted, call local law enforcement immediately. Now, when we come back, a planned escape and surprise betrayal that gave investigators a lead they weren't expecting. Plus, the FBI is offering a $25,000 reward for information that will lead to the arrest of this man. 
an alleged key figure in a large-scale international drug ring. And later on, two thieves in Tampa target multiple valet stands, stealing the keys and driving off with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of luxury cars. Help us find these creeps before they do it again. And remember, you can make a difference. Welcome back to America's Most Wanted. Now, before the break, we saw a missing persons case turn into a homicide investigation. And the two people who were thought to be with her became fugitives, and one of them wanted for murder. So let's see why police need your eyes and ears now more than ever. Two months have passed since Sandy Lee was found murdered deep in the Carolina woods. Their co-workers, Alex Castillo and Amia Feaster, escaped to Mexico. But as the pair try to evade authorities, troubles arise. Amia Feaster was living with Alex's family in Mexico. She did not speak the language, and it was a lot different than she was accustomed to. In the beginning of October, it's believed that Alex left her. Here she is uh, with a family that she doesn't know no money, and uh, I think she missed home. Amia Feaster turned herself in. And from there, we coordinated the apprehension to get her back to the States. She does admit that she did drop Alex off to meet Sandy. A robbery was planned. They were already packed. They were already ready to go to Mexico. There is text exchange between Alex and Amia. Alex was telling her to hold on, that he was doing something with the evidence. She 100% knew that Sandy was dead. So Amia Feaster was charged with accessory after the fact of a felony, which is the murder of Sandy. We are still looking for Alex. The best of our knowledge, we believe that Alex is still in Mexico. We know that he's got a strong support system there. Sandy was just a phenomenal person. This case was senseless. It was brutal. It was calculating. And this one here is one that will always stay with me. I don't think Sandy's family will ever lose hope in Alex being apprehended and brought to justice. We're joined now by Joe Petito, who, like me, knows the pain of losing a child all too well. Joe, thanks so much for being here. No problem, John. Good to Appreciate see you. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here, buddy. Now, social media had a big, big part to find Gabby. And in our case tonight, it's uh, surveillance. You know, Joe, that surveillance video is what helped track Castillo to Mexico. And pinging Sandy's phone helped find her body. These are new techniques that are so helpful. Technology has really changed the game, hasn't it? It does make a difference. Social media was a huge impact on helping us find Gabby, you know, yeah. and it's a huge tool that people can leverage to find their missing loved ones. And the more you can try to get that exposure out there, the better your chances would be. Now, you founded the Gabby Petito Foundation in 2021 after your daughter went missing. And I know you work with local groups as well, searching for, for missing children. What can communities do in cases like that to help? The more exposure you get, the more people that get, you know, that have eyes on those, these missing flyers, the more that gets shared. The more that gets shared, the more maybe local or even national news will pick up those stories. And that's what you really want. And that's why stories and stuff that you guys do is important because it gets, you know, their faces out there. Like the one that we're talking about here, getting his name out there and a picture out there on a national, you know, broadcast is hopefully going to have that huge impact to find him and bring him to justice because Sandy's family deserves that. Absolutely, that's what we're all about. Investigators told us that Sandy's family found some comfort in the fact that her body was able to be recovered. What would you tell her family? How do they keep going? You and I talked about this. How do you take a tragic loss and deal with it? No, that's it. You actually gave me some of the best advice, you know, during that time. And you can go down that dark path or you can go to kind of what you do, the pain into purpose type of deal, you know, and really try to focus on healing that way, and that's something that I do. Uh, that would be my recommendation. I don't know what's gonna work for them, and to be honest with you, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. God bless you for what you're doing. Your daughter's up there going, go, Dad, go, Dad. I hope so. You know, I'm hoping at the end of the day, after all the work that we do collectively together, and all the help that everyone got, and all the support, 
It's got to continue for others. Well, keep up the good work. You're making a difference. We're proud of you. Thank you, John. Thanks for being here. Joe, thank you very much. Have you seen Alex Castillo? Alex Castillo is wanted for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for murder. He's got black hair and brown eyes. He's five foot six, and at the time he was last seen, weighed about 185 pounds. He'd be 25 years old now, and we have an AMW age progression of what he may look like today, both with and without facial hair. Authorities have a strong reason to believe that Castillo is hiding out in Mexico, but he may be in Aguas Calientes, where he has family, or the Mexican states of Guanajuato or Veracruz. It's also possible he's made his way back to the states. He has ties to Phoenix, Arizona, and his last known residence was in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives, and they're offering a reward of up to $250,000 for information that leads to his arrest. Doesn't matter if you live in the U.S. or our friends in Mexico. If you have any information, remember, you can always remain anonymous. Call us or go to our site, 866-AMW-TIPS or amwtips.com. Coming up next, a small town in West Virginia becomes an unlikely epicenter for narcotics trafficking. And in the middle of all of it, one man who police need your help to find. Have you seen Samuel Rose? And later on, a woman is murdered on the East Coast, and the DNA from the scene links the suspect to an assault five months earlier on the opposite side of the country. And the dangerous suspect is still out there. But first up throughout the show tonight, we'll be featuring local crimes that we need your help to solve, maybe right where you live. Police need your help tracking down a pair of suspects who have recently stolen luxury vehicles from more than one valet in the Tampa, Florida area, and possibly up to five related incidents. Watch this surveillance video of the pair from last summer, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, casing the unattended valet stand before brazenly grabbing the keys in plain view of everyone around them. Take a good look. Without anybody suspecting, one locates the car in the lot and waits for his buddy to drive right out of there. Here they are again a month later, helping themselves to keys from the valet stand before hopping in another car that doesn't belong to them and driving away. Police say these two may be allegedly responsible for five different incidents of vehicle theft, including a Land Rover Discovery, a Mercedes C63, and a Lamborghini. If you've seen either one of these lowlifes, call us or send us your tips right now. 866-AMW-TIPS or amwtips.com. Welcome back to America's Most Wanted. Now, the number one goal for AMW is to find fugitives, but also to find as many missing children as we possibly can and reunite them safely with their families. So this week, we need your help to find 13-year-old Noelle Sophie Zizi. Noelle's from Kennesaw, Georgia, but maybe in Dallas, Texas. She has brown eyes and black hair. And when she was last seen, she was four foot one and weighed between 90 and 100 pounds. Noelle went missing in October, 2021. So if you've seen Noelle Zizi, please call us or send your tips to 866-AMW-TIPS or amwtips.com. Let's get her home safe and back with her family where she belongs. Cal, over to you. Martinsburg, West Virginia is known for its historic past. Walking down Main Street, you'll find buildings standing from the 1700s. But these days, the small town feels different, dangerous, and has become a breeding ground for drug traffickers. Martinsburg, West Virginia is a very friendly, close-knit town, about an hour and a half from Baltimore, Maryland, and about the same proximity from Washington, D.C., where you really do get to know your neighbors. Unfortunately, our proximity to the cities makes us an easier target in the drug epidemic in our area. But with a high level of addiction in this state due to its bad job market, dealers and suppliers in large cities look at us as a cash cow in a sense. A lot of the local dealers that we see in West Virginia are children that grow up in the juvenile justice system that we've dealt with when they were students, engaged in low-level drug transactions, and as they become adults, they become higher-level drug dealers, like Sammy Rose. 
Samuel Rose is a community member that grew up here in Martinsburg. He's a very intelligent person who used that high level of intelligence in his criminal activity. And unfortunately, we've had dealings with uh, Sammy Rose through the years. He's been involved in violent crimes for years. In 2000, he committed armed robbery, pistol whipping an individual. In 2007, Samuel Rose was selling crack he was prosecuted federally, was sentenced, and he ended up serving approximately eight years imprisonment. When he was in prison, Samuel Rose's drug connections increased and grew. So when he was released after serving his sentence, the eight-year hiatus actually increased his drug dealing in the area. We started to investigate using a confidential informant who could directly purchase from Samuel Rose. Those controlled purchases allow us to follow through surveillance and learn that Samuel Rose was accessing larger quantities of narcotics than we had known him to access before his arrest. Eventually, we are able to apply to the court for a wiretap on his cellular device. And that really gave us a breakthrough in being able to determine the breadth of his drug trafficking network. There would be calls to obtain cocaine, lining up where these transactions would occur. Where you at, Mr. Well, I'm about to come over here, Send me your that ended up leading us to an appliance business in Hagerstown, Maryland, known as Top Three Sources. Top Three Sources looks like an appliance store that could be on any street in America. They advertised that they would sell on credit, they had a showroom, and they also had a seemingly legitimate bank account and through surveillance of top three sources, we saw appliance shipments at odd hours of the night. And it appears that shipments are coming from a connection within the Dominican Republic. So that was suspicious. We intercepted communications regarding drugs being trafficked from the Dominican Republic. We learned that the organization was concealing the drugs in the appliances, washing machines, dishwashers, dryers, refrigerators, often concealed in the frame of those appliances. Those appliances are then packed into large sea containers shipped up to a port here in the United States. Those sea containers are loaded onto trucks and then transported to Hagerstown, Maryland, where Top Three Sources was located. Through our investigation, we learned that Sammy would obtain large sources of supply and distribute them in the Martinsburg area. At this point, we understand that Samuel Rose is a member of a much larger organization. The owner of Top Three Sources was identified as Lennon Erasmo Lunamoto, also known as Poppy. He was at the head of the drug trafficking organization. His right-hand man was Juan Manuel de la Rosa Tejada, and he was known as Little Poppy. In this organization, Sammy Rose plays the role of the West Virginia drug distributor. It's a huge role for the organization because all the money that comes from places like Martinsburg, West Virginia, makes its way into the organization through the drug sales of Sammy Rose. At this point, we had been involved in the investigation for almost a year. We learned that top three sources had residential units, and at least one housed Little Poppy. So we were able to obtain a search warrant for top three sources. When officers search, they find a significant amount of drugs stored in the appliances. There is approximately a kilogram of fentanyl, a significant quantity of crack, and then also about eight kilograms of cocaine. Arresting Little Poppy was a huge accomplishment. Taking that individual out of the equation was going to have a huge impact for this organization's activities here in West Virginia. The next step is to remove Samuel Rose. We're seeing an unprecedented crackdown on high-level drug traffickers right now. Last year, in what they called Operation Blue Lotus, 
Homeland Security seized 900 pounds of fentanyl and 600 pounds of methamphetamines at the southwest border. And keeping that off the streets, well, that's tremendous because it's not just this poison, it's what comes with it. Violent crime, illegal gun trafficking, and death. It's a whole package. Which is exactly why we need your help finding Samuel Rose. Now, don't go anywhere, because when we come back, officers have put their lives on the line to bring down Rose's operation in a risky raid. We'll see what happens next. Then, he acted alone, changing his identity, keeping a stunning secret for his entire life, a case we even featured right here on AMW way back in 2010. Bank robber turned fugitive Ted Conrad. You won't want to miss this. Welcome back to America's Most Wanted. Now, before the break, authorities had tracked a West Virginia drug ring all the way to the Dominican Republic, a sophisticated operation using appliances to hide and transport the supply. And they were preparing a risky raid, looking to bust Samuel Rose and the men he was working with. Let's see how it all went down. The amount of drugs seized from the top three appliance store was easily over half a million dollars worth just in one particular day of what this business was doing. Ultimately, we were able to indict 34 individuals in this investigation to include Sammy Rose. When our officers went out to effect his arrest, we were unable to locate him. At that time, we realized that Sammy Rose is on the run. Two years after the indictment in September of 2023, the owner of Top 3 Sources, Lennon Erasmo Lunamoto, also known as Poppy, was finally found and arrested in the Dominican Republic, and he was sent to the United States to face charges. Sammy Rose is the last major player from this organization that we've yet to apprehend. We know he has family and friends in the area. So we do not believe that he would stray far from some type of support network. The FBI has put forth a reward in the amount of $25,000 for any information that leads to the successful apprehension of Sammy Rose. He's been involved in drug trafficking. He's been involved in violent crimes. We believe Sammy Rose is a very dangerous individual. He's on the run, and he does not want to be apprehended. That's why this is very important to us that we can get this threat off of the streets. Now we're joined by someone who knows firsthand how drug trafficking works and has put many of these types of criminals behind bars, former DEA agent Bill Bodner. Great to be here, guys. Nice to meet you, yep. and congratulations on 32 years Thank on a you. really dangerous job. What's the craziest case you ever did? You know, one of the funniest things I was ever involved with was in the 90s, uh, a group from the Medellin cartel. They were smuggling cocaine from Los Angeles to New York. They had purchased Willie Nelson's old tour bus at an auction complete with the highwayman mural on the back, and they use that every week to run hundreds of kilos of cocaine from L.A. to New York. So ingenious some of these guys are. The ingenuity in smuggling is almost without limits. They will do anything that works, using appliances, using any kind of heavy equipment, industrial equipment, something that's not really going to be searched because it looks so innocent, yeah. and it's able to be packed in a container and shipped by freight. In this case, the drug ring was out of the Dominican Republic. They were highly sophisticated. What kind of manpower does it take to run an operation like that? It takes a lot of manpower. Like, this is obviously a large, complex organization. And we saw the indictment of 30-plus individuals. That's a lot of work to put that type of case together. How crucial is Rose's alleged part in this drug ring? It's extremely crucial, John. He is the man. He's the one that can convert the drugs to cash. Don't forget, these are greed-based businesses. The real reason they're doing this is because they're greedy. They want to make money. He's the one that has the customers, and he can turn that product into cash. He's a valuable person in this conspiracy. Back in the day, it was the big boys only. Now it's into these little towns, and it devastates these towns. Especially in West Virginia. I mean, they were hit hard by the prescription opiate epidemic in the late 90s, early 2000s. And as a nation, as we tightened up on the prescriptions, right. the demand was still there. So what happened? The drug dealers recognized that, and they started stepping in, filling that void right. since that time. We know Rose had most of his ties in West Virginia. 
in your opinion, do guys like him stay in that area where he has connections, or do you think he's on the run somewhere else? He's probably in the middle Atlantic region, Kyle, and I suspect that he's got a taste of the life from drug trafficking. If he needs money, he's going to still be involved in drug trafficking, probably working with some of the contacts he has in the area. So you think he's still involved in this now? He very well could be. Well, thank you for your hard work. And thank you for what you do. You got me interested in law enforcement in the late 80s, and that's why I had the career I had. Fantastic. Thanks for your hard work all these years. Thank you. Thank you. Samuel Rose is 43 years old with black hair and brown eyes. He's 5'8", and when he was last seen, weighed about 165 to 190 pounds. He has a scar on his stomach and a barbed wire tattoo on his left arm. Rose is facing multiple felony drug charges, including aiding and abetting the distribution of heroin and fentanyl. He has close ties to Martinsburg, West Virginia, and the surrounding areas of Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, and Prince George's County, Maryland. If you see Rose or have any idea where he might be, do not approach him. He's considered armed and dangerous and has a history of violence. Call us or send us your tips now at 866-AMW-TIPS or amwtips.com. Next, a murder in Maryland is linked to an assault four months earlier way across the country in Los Angeles. Can you help us identify this dirtbag? Plus, a dying confession unlike any other. This fugitive reveals his real identity to his family. All this when we come back. Last August, a 37-year-old Maryland mother of five went for a hike and never came home. She was reported missing, and the next day was found brutally murdered in a wooded area just off the hiking trail. When authorities collected and ran the DNA evidence that was found on her body, it was linked to an assault case that happened all the way across the country in Los Angeles just a few months prior. Can you help us find the man responsible for both? Rachel. I know that when people looked at her, they saw how pretty she was, but what made her special was the part of her that shined through her personality. She was very kind and loving, very outgoing, always laughing. Rachel Morin was a single mother of five kids who ran her own business, a cleaning company. And on August 5th, 2023, she headed out on the Ma and Pa Trail around 6.30 in the evening. When she didn't come home, her family knew right away that something wasn't right. The next day, her car was found, still parked at the trailhead. And soon after, so was her body. We're never going to be able to have Rachel back. Our children are never going to have a mother to watch them grow up. It's broken our family apart. Since Saturday, August 5th, 12 days ago, the Hartford County Sheriff's Office has been working around the clock to get justice for Rachel Morin and hopefully bring peace to her family. Authorities didn't have much to go on, but they collected DNA samples from Rachel's body. This DNA was put into the national DNA database used by law enforcement. And what they discovered next would be
rifle everyone. This DNA evidence has come back as a match tied to a home invasion and assault of a young girl in Los Angeles this past March. Hartford police were shocked to find that Rachel's killer had left a DNA trail behind in South Los Angeles. They learned that on March 26, 2023, he had entered a Los Angeles home and attacked a young girl. He was captured leaving the house by a home surveillance camera. The suspect left behind a hat, which is how the LAPD was able to obtain his DNA. Don't they have any real definite information about what happened to Rachel? It's like we have no hope. We have no closure. These victims and their families deserve justice, and we need your help to get it. Now again, the first incident tied to this suspect happened in Los Angeles on March 26th of last year. Four months later, on August 6th, Rachel Morin was found dead along the Ma and Pa Trail in Bel Air, Maryland. And the DNA from that crime scene matched the DNA from the incident in LA. This was a mother who left behind five kids. It's very possible that there are more victims out there. But recently, authorities released a couple sketches of the suspect, so take a good, long look at this guy. In one of them, he's wearing a hat, similar to the one left behind at the crime scene in Los Angeles. He's described as a male in his 20s, who's five feet, nine inches tall, and weighs about 160 pounds. There is a $35,000 reward for any information that leads to the identification and arrest of the man that murdered Rachel Morin. Please, if you know anything, contact us immediately. Do the right thing. Call 866-AMW-TIPS or go to amwtips.com. And we have a very interesting vault case this week. Dad? Now, this one is pretty special. In 1969, Ted Conrad walked out of the Society National Bank with a paper bag containing $215,000. More than 50 years later, as he lay dying, his daughter Ashley was shocked to find out that her father had committed one of the biggest bank robberies in the history of Cleveland, Ohio, and had lived his entire life under a different identity to avoid arrest. We're gonna to talk to her about this mind-blowing discovery and what it meant for her family. But first, take a look at this clip from an episode of America's Most Wanted that aired in 2010. Another fugitive who could be anywhere tonight is Ted Conrad, an all-American kid with boyish good looks and charm to match. Conrad grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. In 1969, he got a summer job. Ted Conrad had been the, the vault teller uh, at Society National Bank. But he had bigger dreams. Ted Conrad had been obsessed with a movie known as The Thomas Crown Affair. And his friends tell us he watched it at least six times. And the movie was all about a bank heist. And it appears that Ted Conrad may have, uh, may have modeled himself after that. According to the FBI, on July 11th, 1969, Conrad left the bank with his lunch bag. Inside of it, $215,000. When tellers realized the money was gone, they noticed Conrad was missing too. The daring robbery made national news, but Conrad vanished. If you know where Ted Conrad's hiding, please call our hotline to take him down. Now we're joined by Ashley Randall, Thomas Randall, AKA Ted Conrad's daughter. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here, Ashley. You know, for 52 years, your father hid his identity, was running from the law. I mean, you had no idea this was going on. We had no idea. Um, my dad was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer in the spring of 2021. And about a month before he passed away, he said, ladies, I changed my name when I moved here. The authorities are probably still looking for me. And you two passed out. No, what? <laughs> <laughs> we thought at first it was a weird dad joke, like, trying to lighten the mood, I Googled him that evening, and I just found page after page of, you know, Vault Teller Rob's bank. He's been missing for 50 years. Right. U.S. Marshals were looking for him. That was terrifying right. to me, that he was still actively being hunted. It was heartbreaking because it felt like the guy I knew was being erased by one day in his life. Did you ever find out what he did with the money? By the time he got together with my mom in the late 70s, the money was gone. So Ashley, how did the marshals piece it all together? 
somebody, I still don't know who, sent my dad's obituary to a crime writer in Ohio who then passed that along to the marshal. And then I believe that they matched handwriting samples from my dad's college applications, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my parents filed for bankruptcy in 2014, so they had his signature on public record there. Were there any signs that your father was capable of something like this, eluding law enforcement for as long as he did? Absolutely not. He was just the best dad. Yeah. Somebody who drove me to school every day. He made my lunch every day. He was the dad that's there for you. But him being fluent in French and keeping that a secret is somehow more shocking than him being a fugitive. He spoke fluent French and you guys didn't know the whole lifetime? He helped me with my French homework the way any parent who doesn't speak French Never started would. spouting out in French. No, no. The, the one thing I have from him was when I was learning to count, he would say the way to remember 16 is says is because when you're 16, you says everything. That's his French knowledge he imparted on He's me. gotta be the most disciplined fugitive I've ever heard of. Well, thank you for having the guts to come here, clear up all this mystery. We profiled your dad on America's Most Wanted, so it closes that chapter, and I'm glad he didn't go on to a life of crime or hurt anybody else. As am I. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. When we return, a recap of all the dangerous fugitives from tonight's show. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Horrifying surveillance video of a midday murder in cold blood. It happened last September on the 7300 block of 19th Street in Philadelphia. Police have now ID'd the shooter, 39-year-old Rodney Zellers, and need your help to find him as soon as possible. Watch as the suspect gets out of a 2012 Blue Ford Edge, makes his way across the street to the 26-year-old victim, gun in hand. From another angle, we see Zellers walk right up to the victim and fire several shots, striking him several times in the torso before running back to the 2012 Blue Ford Edge with PA tags, LLM6974, where an unknown female driver is waiting for him. As soon as Zellers gets in, they quickly flee the scene. The victim died from his injuries soon afterward. Philadelphia police are offering a reward of $20,000 for any information that leads to the arrest of the suspect, Rodney Zellers. Take another good look at him. He's a 39-year-old black male, 5 feet 9 inches tall, and weighing 350 pounds. Have you seen this scumbag? If so, send us your tips. 866-AMW-TIPS or amwtips.com. Now, if you know anything about any of the fugitives you've seen tonight, please do the right thing and contact us immediately. Alex Castillo is one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. He's now 25 years old and is five foot six with black hair and brown eyes. And when last seen, weighed 185 pounds. He may currently be in Aguas Calientes, Mexico, or in the states of Guanajuato or Veracruz. He also has ties to Phoenix, Arizona. We have age progressions of what Castillo may look like today, and there's a reward of up to $250,000 for information that leads directly to his arrest. Now, Samuel Rose is 43 years old with black hair and brown eyes. He's 5'8", and when last seen, weighed between 165 and 190 pounds. He's got a scar on his stomach and a barbed wire tattoo on his left arm. Rose has ties to Martinsburg, West Virginia, and the surrounding areas of Washington, D.C., Baltimore and Prince George's County, Maryland. And finally, this unidentified suspect linked to an assault on a young woman in Los Angeles and the murder of Rachel Morin. Take a really good look. He's a male in his 20s who's around 5 feet 9 inches tall and weighs around 160 pounds. DNA evidence puts him in Los Angeles in March and in Maryland as of August 2023 but authorities think he could be anywhere, and police need your help. And remember, even the smallest tip could break these cases wide open, so please, stay on the lookout. If you have any information about these cases, call us or go to our website now, 